welcome to Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm your host, Richard Dugan, and I thank you so much for joining us on the radio broadcast at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. on a Sunday and Monday mornings at 1 a.m. The broadcast podcasts are available on SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, Stitcher, Player FM, Blueberry, as well as richarddugan.com, the homepage, as well as the radio shows page. And we encourage you, if you can, to support us financially to keep the programs moving forward and take care of all of the ancillary things through PayPal and Patreon accounts. They are for your security as well as ours. We hope that you will do your part and do what you can if you feel led to do so. We'll even take energetic support as well. And we also encourage you to go to our guest's website. We'll be giving you that during the interview so that you can continue your evolutionary process. We also encourage you to uh, spend time in meditation, in prayer, in just quiet time during 2020, the year of perfect vision and the 2020s, the decade of perfect vision. And we hope that you will do that. Listen to that still small voice, that divine self, your higher self, and follow the promptings and find that still, small, quiet, peaceful place where you can just relax and get a hold of what's really important in your life. We encourage you to do that, and we also encourage you to stay tuned to Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan. Stay tuned. Today's program class, uh, we are going to dive into the English language. Why? Well, partly because apparently we're having some difficulty communicating with one another in these times, uh, whether it's of coronavirus, whether it's of the Black Lives Matter, Matter, whether it's the Me Too movement, or any other conversation that we're having trouble with. It's usually... Uh, uh, partly the language that we're speaking. And that isn't to say that anybody's necessarily speaking the wrong language, but we're not taking the time to understand and define our terms or define our words. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about today with our very special guest who I uh, met, which is uh, really kind of cool. Uh, and I'm finding a lot of my guests on LinkedIn. And we're going to talk to Joe Peretta. He is uh, an English instructor out of um, uh, basically Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And Joe, thank you so much for joining us. I hope we're not keeping you out of class today. <laughs> good, good morning, Richard. No, not at all. Uh, really looking forward to our conversation. I think that uh, one of the things that we want to start with is uh, why in the world, with all of the negative uh, press about uh, being a teacher, uh, low pay here in the United States and all of that stuff, would you want to be a teacher? You know, I think uh, when somebody has a calling, when somebody has a passion, uh, that overrides pretty much any amount of money. And uh, I know a lot of teachers, obviously, having done this for over two decades. And I don't think I've ever spoken to one of them who said, you know, I got into this for the money. <laughs> <laughs> and and very few have even said I got into it because I get my summers off. So that's kind of a misnomer that a lot of non-teachers have. Uh, it's a it's a passion for me personally, a passion, a calling, a desire to see people improve. As you were saying in the opening, uh, improvement is uh, something that we strive for. So that's a big part of it for me anyway. I, I love it when the light bulb goes on over somebody's head that they finally got it. And then from there they take off. And no, no amount of money to me really uh, equals that feeling. What is English as a subject? As a subject, uh, I look at English as the form of communication or a form of communication. Um, as you were mentioning before about the understanding element, uh, as much as I focus on writing in my classes, I also focus a lot on listening and paying attention. I think one of the biggest problems we have, not just now in coronavirus days or uh, Black Lives Matter and other you know, stressful things that we're enduring, 
is just we are not good listeners. And when it comes to writing or analyzing literature, both of which I do frequently in the classroom, there's not enough, not enough listening or paying attention to what's being said, what's being read, what's being written. So for me as a subject, English is absorbing, you know, understanding, as you said, what, what is being expressed. And people just don't put the effort into that like they should. What is English as a language? As a language, it is, again, a, a primary form of communication, and it, it, and it evolves, too. That was something I wanted to say before, is that we frequently have to keep up with the evolution or the change in vocabulary, which is always happening. So th there's a lot to it. So what made you choose English as a subject to teach? Um, yeah, a couple of things. Number one, like I said, I'm not so sure I chose it as much as it chose me. And I never really, when I was a student, had a desire to be a teacher, let alone an English teacher. But I had a professor who became my mentor, who was a speech professor, actually. And he said to me once about, geez, now 30 something years ago, one day you're going to be up here doing what I do. And I looked at him like he had 12 heads. So <laughs> when, 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 when the time came and I first got that urge to that, you know, I could do this, I thought about him. And he's like, wow, he saw something in me that I did not see in myself. So as I said, I don't think so much it chose, uh, I chose it as much as it chose me. And uh, I kind of let it take me <laughs> to where I've been the last 20 plus years. What do you start with? And I guess I should next, the next question should be, what is uh, the grade level that you teach? I teach uh, mostly college freshmen and some upperclassmen as well. Okay. When I was speaking before the communications division or association, at UCSB here in Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. The first question that I asked was, does anybody know what syntax is? And actually it wasn't the first question, be that as it may. Um, and someone of course piped in as, as is normal in these uh, mm -hmm. kinds of conversations. Oh, well that's the, that's the tax that uh, prostitutes pay. <laughs> you know, and I'm going, yeah. uh, that's cute. No. <laughs> right. Right. And um, so I, uh, I said, no. I says, anybody in here in computer programming? Anybody know what that, uh, that's all about, coding? Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they, you know, some of them raised their hands. But primarily it was... It was, uh, okay, let's talk about computer syntax. Did you know that if one character is off, if one uh, character is reversed, then you're doomed. The program won't work. Right. Yep. And... The other thing that I, of course, asked as well was, does anybody, and this comes from broadcasting, does anybody know how long a 30-second commercial is supposed to be? Mm. Does anybody know how uh, a 60-second commercial is supposed to be? And, of course, I didn't get the answer that, of course, I was looking for. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't believe my ears that these people in college did not know the answers to these questions. Simple questions. Where do you yeah. start when you enter the classroom? I don't know if it's in August or September. When you enter the classroom, right. uh, obviously it's a little different these days. Yeah. Where do you begin with English 
I'm going to say one on one. Yeah, yeah, um, and that's usually in English, in English one or in English one on one. That's that's right. Uh, <laughs> it's interesting because probably the biggest challenge for me as an instructor is day one, because I have no idea where these students are, let's say, in their writing uh, prowess or lack thereof. Uh, so that's always the biggest challenge. And the other challenge is that some of them think they're great writers because they were given A's in high school. And the fact of the matter is they are not great writers. They were just graded based on the fact that they turned in work. So these are all things that I've learned over the years. So what I do on day one is basically introduce myself and say, we are all going to be starting at the same level. And whether you find yourself above that level right now or believe you're above that level or you think that you're below that level right now, none of that really matters. Because what I've learned is I've got to disavow students of some preconceived notions they have about their abilities or lack thereof. And the only way I can do that is from day one, say, forget about pretty much everything that you've been told or taught or believe that you know from the past, because much of it is not going to serve you in this class. And a few of them look at me like I have those 12 heads like my <laughs> advisor did years ago. Uh, and for me, that's, that's the best way to start simply because for some of them, it puts them at ease because, like I said, they think that they're not ready for a college writing class. Others, they're kind of you know, stressed by what I said because you know, they think they're such good writers. But that's where I start. I basically have, it's, it's, it's as much psychological as it is a uh, physical form of writing. I just, you know, we, we've got to just level the playing field from day one and take it from there. Uh, because if you don't do that, you've pretty much lost quite a few of them. You know, it's it's interesting how in grade school, and I still remember uh, my grade school English teacher, Mrs. Haas, uh, I was just, I was bored out of my mind. Mm -hmm. But when I got to high school, I had a Southwest literature class. Mm -hmm. And... I loved it because the instructor, whose name was Mr. Miller, he was a fun guy. Right. He was one who made uh, Southwest literature, and it wasn't actually English, but it was close enough in my book. Uh, right. He made writing. We had to write essays or we had to write short stories. I even wrote a short story that I got great marks on. Mm -hmm. uh, it was called Conflagration at Sea. I'll tell you the story after the interview. Okay, But uh, the one of the things that made it so much fun was we were sitting there and I can't remember if we were reading or writing or what we were doing. There was dead silence in the room. And in our high school, you know how high schools are usually walls are paper sure. thin. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a class next door that was watching a film. And all of a sudden you heard this, this uh, choir of angelic angels and they were going, oh. And I just kind of looked at my best friend next to me and looked around the room and I just said, oh, judge, it's judgment day. <laughs> got the, and, and got the biggest laugh. <laughs> but this guy was so cool about it. But yeah. you know, when it really kicked in was college. When I went to mm -hmm. community college and I thought, you know, I should take an English. I should take English 101 just to see what it's about. Right. And the first day of the class, uh, I thought, oh, my God, I've made a mistake. I need to get out of this class because they said, yeah. you're going to write five essays. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to write an essay. I don't like exactly. writing. I, I got to tell you, that was yeah. the funnest class. Mm -hmm. uh, most of my essays were about uh, Star Trek themes. <laughs> uh -huh. But, hey, that's what I knew back then. Yeah, sure. That was great. Yeah. And I have two pet English pet peeves. I, I don't know mm -hmm. if I shared this with you or not. But they are, number one, there are no O's in phone numbers. That's right. 
Yeah. The phone number here my is 805. I lived in Phoenix when it was 602. Mm -hmm. And that's how I pronounced it. Yes. All right. That's number one. Number Now, the only exception to the rule is if you're spelling out a word on the keypad from the letters. Mm -hmm. The only exception. Right. Number two is when you're watching television, you're listening to the radio, you're listening to the news or the DJ, what have you, and they introduce themselves. Nine times out of ten, they say, and this is Richard Dugan spinning the t tunes for you to listen to, right. blah, blah, blah. Right. Wrong. When you are behind the camera, or I should say in front of the camera, or in front of the mic, oh, that's mm -hmm. funny. They say in front of the camera or behind the mic, be that as it may. Yeah. <laughs> You're talking to one person. And Joe, yes. if I was introducing you to a third party, I'd say, Bill, this is Joe. Right. That's when I would use this is. I would right. never say... Hi, Bill. This is Richard. Introduce exactly. him. You wouldn't do that in person. Why are you doing it in broadcasting? Oh, yeah. There's a third one yeah. that I have a question for, for you. Sure. And, and, and I'm hoping that you can deal with this one because this is real interesting. I used to work for a radio reading service for the blind and visually impaired back in uh, 79, 80, 81, and so forth. And they would read the newspapers in the morning and in the evening because we had two papers in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And they had to go through and they literally did have to edit the stories because the paragraph might start out by saying, uh, because you knew who the article was about, say it was about Bill Close. All right. And then the first paragraph, they introduced Bill Close was da 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 Paragraph two. He said, da 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 He said. Mm -hmm. In other words, the grammar for some reason is different in the newspaper than it is in conversation, in normal writing. Mm. Uh, they wouldn't read it that way uh, on, the, on TV in the news. What's the difference between, and I don't know whether I should call it newspaper uh, English or, or journalism English, but are you familiar with the difference between these two aspects of expressing our language and expressing these stories? Yeah, the only difference I can really tell, I mean, is that essay writing or academic writing tends to be more formal or in an extreme more stodgy, whereas the idea behind journalistic writing is that it should be more... I don't know, uh, if not more conversational, at least more common language, let's say, shorter sentence structure or, you know, things like that. That's really the only major difference that I'm familiar with. I, I know there are different styles of writing, uh, but I would foresee that, you know, in order for newspapers to sell, if, you know, if you, even physical newspapers sell anymore, but for them to sell, they would have to be a lot, a lot shorter in syntax and, uh, and in style. Yeah, it's, it's, it, you know, and, and again, I do know that there are certain circumstances under which um, we, we speak differently. I mean, yes. we, we write differently. Uh, poetry is a whole different thing. Although, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's funny, people who don't like poetry, boy, they love music. And I say, well, you know, that's funny. You love poetry. He said, no, I don't. Yeah, you do. Yeah. It's just that your poetry is lined up with music. Yeah, and it, it's interesting that people don't see, that you don't, don't see that similarity. Yeah. And it's very interesting for me to, uh, uh, to, to, to um, listen to music going back for me. 40 years, mm -hmm. 50 years. Uh, I just turned 60 this year. And I'm not really into the, the modern music. Not because I don't like it. I'm not that old guy. Okay. Yeah. Not that old guy. Because uh, every form of music has its, it is an expression of the times and of that individual mm -hmm. and so forth. Uh, sure. What's really funny though is, is a lot of the music from the, four, going back 40, 50 years, it's like it could have been written for today's uh, situations, you know, it's yeah. just amazing to me. 
When well, I think thematically, thematically, there's a lot in common. It's just the presentation of it that's different. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I tell you what, you know, it's exciting to me to think about the possibilities that are out there. But what about the juxtaposition of the language? Because English is about, not just about the language, but it is about the language. And how the language, correct me if I'm wrong here, how the language has changed over the centuries, let alone over the last few decades, especially with uh, communication via texting and, and, and alike. Yeah. I, I think the biggest difference, uh, the biggest change has been uh, – a lack of concern for correctness, let's say, whether it be grammar or syntax. And certainly spelling has gone by the boards. I, my wife teases me. I used to be an outstanding speller, and then I started teaching, and my spelling went down the tubes. So, <laughs> because I, I, I've seen so many incorrectly spelled spelled words over the years, and I start to question my own uh, abilities. But I, I think the overall lack of concern with you know, so-called correctness has been the biggest change in, uh, in language and the use of language. And that's been because of texting or just even prior to texting, things that used to be focused on or harped on when we were in school, like correct spelling or like uh, proper syntax is not taught anymore. Yeah. And, you know, and the students can't know what they're not taught. And we're graduating, and this has been going on for quite a while now, we are now graduating students with master's degrees in education or in English who are now going into classrooms unable to teach what they you know, are either expected to teach in some cases or just you know, don't know these basic skills that we were, you know, taught day after day after day. So I just think the biggest, the biggest difference now has been, you know, what's important and what's not. I think that's really changed considerably with things like presentation, both in the spoken word and the written word. So do you think that uh, from my perspective, from my standpoint, I should go easy on people when they are uh, <laughs> going down what I consider that path? Um, because, as you just said, they can't know what they don't know. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and yet, I remember uh, sending my book, which is called Choices, Five Steps for Life. I sent my a book to my sister, elder mm -hmm. sister, uh, for proofreading because she's a proofreader. Right. And she sent it off. She, I sent it off, and I got it back about two weeks later. And, she sh and in the corrections, she had turned all of my commas in lists to mm -hmm. ands and hmm. before i called her and said uh no that's not correct i started asking around people who knew and it turns out that is just as correct grammatically as the commas with the last item in the list uh denoted by an and you know Red, yeah. black, blue, green, yellow, and, or red and. and black and blue and yellow and green and. Uh, turns out they're both just fine. Mm. So I never called my yeah. sister. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it, it, it's interesting, too. I think part of it is also what we get used to. Um, and using that example that you just gave with the colors, I, for one, am more used to seeing the commas between the items within the and before the the last item in the list. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think I think part of it is is part of it is conditioning. Also, the fact that most people don't know don't know the rules of grammar or punctuation, or in some cases that there are even rules. Uh, so uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, you know, I, yeah. So that's the other thing. And as far as do, do you go easy on somebody who does who, who wasn't taught? I mean, you got to take it on a case by case basis, and yeah, how egregious are they in in their misuse of the language also so i mean i 
I tend not to like to teach with the rules beyond a certain point. I'll teach after the first day of class once I've you know, disavowed certain students of their abilities or lack thereof. We get into a writing process that I want them to follow, but I do it not to be rigid as much as to give them direction. And that's what they really want. A lot of them really want and need is, okay, how do I do this? How do I get this writing? How do I write this essay? So the, the process gives them a game plan or you know, something to use to help them get to the end result. Well, I'll tell you, you know, it's, it's, it's complicated because it has, I, correct me if I'm wrong, because you're the English teacher here and I want to <laughs> learn from you. Uh, and I do like, I do enjoy writing, but I'm not sure whether it's really writing when you're not actually using a pen and on paper, as I grew up with, as opposed to right. typing into a computer, as opposed to speaking it into your computer or your, your device and so forth. Um, my understanding is that English is one of the hardest languages to learn because, this is what I've heard, mm -hmm. it has 65 different tenses. Mm -hmm. I got enough trouble with you, me, him, her, them, they, and yeah. I know that, and then the list goes on, you know? Right, 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 right. Uh, is that kind of the experience uh, is that why the experience of most Americans who were born and raised here, they find it so difficult, whereas uh, foreigners, I'll call them foreigners, people who immigrate here, who move here, who visit here, and they want to be able to communicate, they will go out of their way to learn the language. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the first I've actually heard of, what did you say, 65 tenses? That's, that's what I heard astounding. years ago, years ago. Maybe yeah. it's less now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's astounding. But uh, I, think, I think there is something to it. And that's been my experience also. Students who have learned English as a second language have gained a structure in their native language that they've um, been able to apply in some ways to their learning of English. And I don't know if it's because, you know, grammar in their native tongue was taught in their homelands, whereas it's really not taught here in America anymore, or, or what the case is. But I've, de I've definitely seen where the students, you know, who, you know, come to America from another country get a facility with the English language faster than the native uh, speaker, native writer does. Um, and again, I, th I think a lot of it comes from the fact that there has been a lack of focus on the structure of writing, the structure of grammar in, in our classrooms in elementary school now for many years. So it's a ground, you know, it's, a, it's a grassroots thing, let's say, you know, if, if it's not taught in elementary school and that's and sometimes the buck is passed you know it's not taught in one grade and they'll say oh they'll learn this next year and then next year becomes the next year and before you know it they've graduated high school without you know some of these basic skills uh but yeah i, I agree with you i think i think that the uh, esl students have definitely um done better with the grammatical issues than the uh the american kids have well, I'll tell you what, it's, uh, it's really, uh, really something uh, to, if you can get into it. And I have to say that it wasn't until college. It was then my choice, uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to grade school or high school. Right. And, um, and yet now I wish that I hadn't had, the, and that's the other thing, uh, the other aspect of teaching, I'm sure. Now I wish I didn't have all those distractions in grade school and in high school. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest problems that we have in our institute, educational institutions, uh, primary, secondary, is the distractions uh, yeah. of all of the other things that we have to teach our kids uh, about being safe, if somebody uh, with a weapon comes on campus, uh, mm -hmm. drugs, sex, all of these other things, which are important, right. don't get me wrong. Right but they're great distractions from being able yeah. to really get an education. And of course, that's why I love uh, the fact that I feel as though in my 40 plus years of doing this, that um, I have, uh, I feel like I've gotten my PhD because of the people 
that our mm -hmm. programmers have brought into the studio over the years talking about so many incredible subjects i mean you name one and i'll say yeah we had somebody on talking about that right uh and getting into the conversation and even doing this program or being or interviewing people myself for nearly mm -hmm. four, for 40 years um you know there are things that i didn't know i didn't know and now i know them and you know there are times i wish i didn't know that but <laughs> right. you right. know that's the whole point that we make about giving people choices and knowledge of those choices uh, and that is giving them choices giving them the awareness of what that choice means what it could mean to you uh, how it could change your life uh, we use the analogy of uh, somebody walking on a uh, on a road and they follow the white line of the shoulder because the fog is so thick and the village they come from what you do every day when you're going to go to school or the market or this or that you follow that line suddenly mm -hmm. one day the fog lifts and now you see a fork in the road what do you do oh, right. my god you have a you have a new choice, a new opportunity here. What now you there's no judgment here. If you mm -hmm. want to stick with following the white line, that's fine. But what might you find down that road? And that's why uh, we do programs like this that aren't necessarily uh, focused completely on the whole metaphysical and spiritual world and new paradigms for a new world and and finding those new ways of living but how can you so to speak self-educate if you can't read if yeah. you can't communicate if people don't understand what you are saying because your vocabulary your personal vocabulary is so limited do you help students through that process? Because I personally do not believe in remedial courses after high school. If you mm -hmm. don't have the basics, I'm not judging you here. Let's get you the basics so that right. you're ready to hit the ground running in college. Right. Yeah, I agree with you completely. Um, and, and you know, you said, you said choices before too. Uh, and let me say, if I'm in a class with 20 students, invariably there will be some who are there because they were either told they have to be there or, you know, if they're not there, then their parents are going to, you know, whatever. So immediately of those 20 students, I know a few of them, I unfortunately will not get through to because they have chosen not to be teachable. But for those who are in truly interested and those who want to improve, uh, there are ways to work on improving things like vocabulary. And I'm not an advocate of, you know, study these 20 words and their definitions, because I think that just sort of quantifies and closes them off to, you know, further experiences with vocabulary. But I found that if students listen and if they pay attention to conversations in the classroom or outside of the classroom, just in their natural course of their day, their vocabulary can improve because they're now starting to hear things, hear words that they either haven't heard before or, you know, don't, hadn't known how to use in the correct context. I've, even, I've had students over the years say to me occasionally, you know, what was that word you said about blah, 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 and then I'll repeat it. And if they have further questions about it, I, they're showing the interest and that's how their vocabulary improves, but they've got to want to do it. And it's got to be more of a natural thing than something that's forced. And a lot of education really comes down to choice. You know, the old saying, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's more than just, it's more than just a, you know, a cute saying, it's a fact. Yeah. So you're not really into per se vocabulary words sure. and, and so forth, but right you are into expanding one's vocabulary. Do you think that, because uh, there are some incredible programs, whether you go to, and again, most of this is online these days, but sure. uh, you know, in terms of on demand, if you go to PBS and you watch some of the British program, you go to 
I, for example, I go to Sky News. I love watching Sky News because I get stories that I wouldn't ordinarily get. And sure. you start right. hearing words that you've heard before. Yeah. But it's like, wow, I haven't heard that word in a long time. My mother would uh, use certain words to describe our behavior. Uh, mm-hmm. Something so fastidious. Okay. Yeah. Don't be so persnickety. Okay. Uh, yeah. Two of my wife's favorite words are supercilious and superfluous. <laughs> okay. Uh-huh. Uh, I loved during the uh, Ev Meekum trial for uh, impeaching him as governor of Arizona. Uh, I loved uh, pejorative, the word pejorative. Mm. Okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the, and, and, and some of these words will fall into our, our uh, current lexicon and others won't. Yeah. But I find those kinds of things that pop up. I love using um, um, certain words to describe things. They're kind of big words. Those, you know, $15 words as they call them. Right, right. right? Uh, and, and I throw those in not to be mean or anything because, but it's just, it just fits for me. I, I, I love, you know, uh, the word yeah. codify. I love using the word codify. Mm-hmm. You know? Um, and, and words of that nature. Uh, is, is this something that um, can help us maybe watching some of these programs, maybe even on the, on the radio or the internet? Do you know that I have an app on my phone that allows me to span the globe and listen to different radio stations mm. uh, at, of different languages, but even radio stations that are in English, but they're run by the people of that country. Uh, but they speak right. English. Uh, right. What about that in terms of uh, uh, experiences for ourselves that can kind of open things up and, 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 and really maybe open up a world that we never even knew existed? Yeah, and I think now more than ever. I mean, there are so many outlets and so many you know, places that a student or any of us could look uh, to expand vocabulary or the, the use of different words, whether it be things online or you know, television or what have you. It, there's just so many opportunities. It, it certainly can't hurt. I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah, it, it's out there, but you know, that, the intellectual curiosity has to be there in order for that to happen. I really don't think that you know, if people are told you've got to look at this or you've got to listen to that, that they're going to be as apt yeah, you know, to do it as though as they would if they were you know, truly interested in doing it on their own. But yeah, it's certainly certainly helpful. Uh, and whether, whether they're students or journalists or whatever the case may be, if we can expand our horizons with regards to vocabulary and language, it's only going to improve our own presentation. I want to talk about punctuation when we get back, which is part of syntax. We're going to do that with Joe Peretta. He is an English teacher out of Pennsylvania. uh, And um, he is, I think, still going to be teaching, even if it's on online or remotely via Zoom as we're talking today. And we thank him so much for giving us a lot of time. Is there a website before we break here that you would recommend to people? um, And and I realize it's not going to be the Rosetta Stone of, of websites, but a website that if people really want to improve their English language skills as well as their syntactual skills, that is not a word in the uh, vocabulary, ladies, or the, uh, the dictionary. I made it up. Uh, but is there a place where people can go to, to, that, that you would send them? Um, the University of Iowa, um, I think it's you know, uofiowa.edu tends to have uh, a very good site with regards to their English department and their writing area has outstanding uh, sources on there with regards to writing and vocabulary and literature. So that's one that I often tend to send my students to beyond you know, whatever other information I provide to them. So I, say, I think it's universityofiowa.edu is okay. you know, the website. Well, the other beautiful thing is if they can't find it that way, they can Google it. Google it, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. We're going to continue our conversation with Joe Peretta here on Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. And we're only putting a comma at the end of this sentence sentence, (laughs) because we will be right back. Three, 
two, one. Welcome back to Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, and I am here with Joe Peretta. He is an English teacher. This is English 101. The grade levels, again, that you teach are, what, high school? Uh, college level college. freshmen and some upperclassmen also. College. College. I love that. Now, uh, punctuation is a big deal. That's part of the syntax. We talked about yes. that a little while ago as far as uh, my sister proofreading my book. And I find it interesting um, that there are certain symbols that I have investigated over the last few years, and it's in reference to the Internet, that we never even knew existed or were not aware existed until the mm -hmm. Internet until email, until texting, until social media. I found out that the ampersand is also an abbreviation for the word and, A-N-D. But I found it interesting that that symbol has a name, but the lowercase a with a circle around it that we refer to as at, doesn't, as far as I know, does not actually have a name. It's just the at symbol. And it's, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's interesting. I never even knew. I, I mean, I knew about the ampersand, but I did not right. know about the at symbol. Uh, matter of fact, I love using the and symbol when I'm writing checks. Yes, I write checks, ladies and gentlemen. I still do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Although that may come to an end someday soon. So you're, so you're the one, Richard. I'm the one. Yes, I'm who's mucking up the works. That's the one. I'm the guy. So you just come to me and I'll, I'll take the blame for that. Um, what about, I mean, everybody knows about, well, most people know about commas, periods, forward and backslash, question marks, exclamation points, colon, semicolon. Um, hyphens, underscore, and so forth. These are all part of the syntax of the language uh, for English. They may use them in other languages. I don't know because I don't speak nor read any other languages. Right. Um, talk to us about how punctuation, the role that punctuation plays in English, uh, whether it be written, well, I always tell people when I speak, I'm always misspelling words, mm -hmm. but who's going to know? Right. <laughs> but yeah. in writing in particular, yeah. you've got punctuation. Talk to us about uh, syntax, talk to us uh, about the role of punctuation, the importance of it or unimportance of it in our language today. Yeah, you know, I think it's important, certainly, um, especially if you're doing any form of formal writing, as I like to call it. Uh, I think in some cases when students are learning how to write or trying to improve their writing, they're focusing a little too much on punctuation, but that's not to understate the, uh, the importance of the punctuation. Um, initially, if they know where, when they should be putting a period, that's to me the most important thing because at least they're showing that they're understanding a, a one idea is ending and another one is starting in the form of syntax. Uh, and it's funny too, if I can just tell one personal story, commas tend to be the thing that so many students harp on. They harp on them even more than I do <laughs> in the classroom. I could be showing them or pointing out like three or four, if not egregious errors that they've made in their writing. Yeah, things I really want them to focus on. And then at the end they'll say, gee, I really just don't know how to use commas. <laughs> so, for some reason, that seems to be the uh, the, the big uh, stumbling block for some of them, some of these students uh, as they're learning how to write. But yeah, I, uh, punctuation is important as far as um, you know, getting if 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 the goal of writing is to get your message across on the on a page to somebody, then punctuation plays a key role as along with the words that you're choosing to use in getting that message across. So yeah, I think, I think it's important. Uh, some forms of punctuation more important than others probably, but yeah, it, it is important as far as the syntax is concerned. You know, it's, to me, it's, it is really kind of exciting. I mean, I, I, 
I'm right. I'm working on my book and I, I'm, have you written a book? Yes. Several years ago, I actually wrote a book about my experiences being mired in credit card debt and what I did to get out of it. Ah, I changed my name. I moved to another country and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm working on my book, trying to finish it. Uh, as I said, I sent it to my sister for proofing, but I, I think there's still more I've got to add to it. And I've been working on it for 19 years. So right. <laughs> there's no rush, apparently. Right. Um, but I really am, uh, when I'm writing, what's interesting is those lessons that I learned back in high school and even in college, they come flashing back and I'm going, okay, is this right? Is that right? Even mm -hmm. using the proper the proper version of a word, whether it's the word to or the word there mm -hmm. or uh, any other word that has, see if I have this correct, that has synonyms, yes. words that sound the same but, but mean differently, Sorry. okay? Yeah. Uh, like the word fly. There are at least two versions of the word fly. Yeah, actually, actually those, those I, would be... Yeah, I just, those would be yeah, hom homonyms. Yeah, yeah, those are homonyms. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I just thought of a third one. There's there's fly like the fly on the wall. There's fly like to right. fly in a plane, and then there's the 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 the, the uh, um, slang. Man, that's fly. It's fly. Exactly. I mean, that's good. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and those are only three that I've come up with. There may be more. Right. Um, that to me is interesting. That those things still pop mm -hmm. up. And so if these things are taught to our kids, young people, because young people are in college, but I know that there are yeah. other older folks that are going to college too. Sure. 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 Um, my gosh, it just seems to me like it would open up an incredible world. When you're standing in front of the class, you can tell the students that are focused and then those that are kind of, eh, I'm here, I just got to get through this and, you know, yeah. and then I'll be done. Uh, do you find that it, there's a difficulty on your part, not because of your teaching uh, uh, skill and ability, but just because of the student, that it's really hard to get through to some of these people that, uh, to, to share with them that there is a level of importance and you really do need to learn this? Yeah, and it goes back to what I was saying a little while ago, too. You know, uh, and nobody can be forced to learn anything. You know, they've got to, they've got to want it just pretty much like anything in life, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you don't want it, you're not going to go after it. You're not going to do what, what it takes to get it. So yeah, that, that's always a challenge. And I don't know if it's, if it's been with my years of experience doing this now or whatever, but in the past, you know, it was pretty much if a student didn't care at the beginning of the semester, chances are they weren't going to care at the end of the semester either if they even if they even made it to the end of the semester and didn't withdraw beforehand. But nowadays, in the last few years in particular, I've seen where some of these students who didn't care at the beginning of the semester started to care as they went along. And it wasn't even anything that I did that made this change anything that I did differently, it was they would see some of their classmates start to get it and start to improve. And these other students would almost say like, hey, I don't want to be left behind. So it was almost like a form of positive peer pressure, if you will. They would see that what I was teaching was making sense and was applicable. And these other students were doing it and getting it and getting the results. So that kind of, they kind of like jumped on their coattails and started doing the right thing. So yeah. it, it was been an interesting sort of, it's been an interesting dynamic. So I've learned that just keep on doing what I'm doing. And ultimately, if those students who were difficult at the beginning decide that they were going to do it, yeah, they would ultimately get on board. Well, I'll tell you, it's, it's really uh, interesting that we we don't take some of these subjects more seriously. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 English is really, I think, critical. Um, biology for me, and we're not talking high end stuff. You're just some basic stuff. 
I think yeah. that if most people had taken biology and really learned from it, I think we'd have less of a problem in this country today fighting over whether or not we should have masks or not, fighting over whether or not we should social distance or wash our hands yeah. or right. that anything is really going on, you know? Yeah. Um, and quite honestly, I, I look at it this way. I, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily uh, abdicating, you know, but what I am saying is, guess what, folks? We're here now. Deal with it. Yeah. You know, um, you know, and and most of the people who are complaining now probably they gave in, so to speak. They chose to follow the rules at the beginning, and all of the sudden, they've changed their minds. And I find that that's really. I mean, that's okay. You want to change your mind. Mm -hmm. But I find that that's really interesting based upon the fact that they haven't based it on any real facts, any real science, any real biology. And I find it fascinating. By the way, have you gotten your endocrinological uh, degree yet? Because most of the journalists in this country and uh, many, many of the people uh, in this country now have apparently have them because they all know better than anybody else. Yeah, I have not gotten that degree yet. I, you haven't gotten I'm it. Still, I'm, I'm still in the classroom, actually. You're, you're just in the mail. <laughs> I'm, still in, I'm, I'm still in the learning phase, I guess, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and so am I. And so am I. Uh, it's, and I, I wonder if many – do you ever have students in college who, uh, who uh, basically um, – they um, – <laughs> they, they, um, uh, what do I want to say? They come in thinking that they know everything. Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's, and that's what I said earlier on, you know, if from day one, I have some of those students come in and they got A's and they got A's in their high school classes, except because they turned in work, but they weren't really taught how to write. So, yeah, I used to, I, I guess I was more either defensive or when I lacked the experience I have now, I would be like, well, you know, I think you have to blah, blah, blah. Now, if they have the attitude of, you know, I already know all this stuff, I'm like, okay. You know, and then they turn in their first piece of writing and I've, you know, made either corrections or comments about what needs to be improved or what they did wrong. Mm -hmm. And then they'll talk to me and they're like, well, I was never taught this before. I was like, well, then you don't know everything, I guess, do you? <laughs> so, you know, and that's, yeah, and I'm, I'm nice about it. Sure, I'm necessarily, sure. you know, yeah. come right off and be that sarcastic, but I get the point across. And then they start to get annoyed that they weren't taught these things earlier. And I'm like, well, now it sounds as though you're ready to learn because now you, you've gone from thinking you know everything to saying, wow, there's room for improvement. And now that's, that's somebody with whom I can work. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I remember learning early on in my career, uh, it is better to begin in doubt and end in certainty than to begin in certainty and end in doubt. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I don't know. I don't know who said it, but I'm saying it now. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great. It's a great line. It's very true. Yeah. yeah. And and I've really worked hard to live by that because what I found is if I get too big for my britches, the universe has a way of humbling me. Mm -hmm. Not yeah. humiliating, but humbling. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, they uh, also say if you're the, they also say if you're the smartest one in the room, go into a different room. I go into a different room. Yeah. So let me ask you, Joseph, um, how has our language changed or transformed, I suppose, evolved? Some would even say devolved over, yes. <laughs> and I'm not even sure how, what time frame we want to look at, whether it's the last 10 years, the last uh, 100, 200, or what have you. Maybe we should keep it more local. Uh, I want to say, let's say in the last 60 years, since I was born. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm not that far off from there myself. <laughs> um, there's, there's definitely been more informality, let's say, in our language over the last generation or so, certainly. And whether that be because of the advent of email or texting or what have you, um, I just don't think that there is as much emphasis placed on the formal spoken word as there used to be. There isn't that much emphasis placed on... <laughs> clear formal communication and that's not necessarily saying that the language 
the use of the language has been abused so much as much as it has changed. Uh, I think people are now more interested in either communicating quickly or just you know, the informality of things than they are about things like correctness. Correctness doesn't seem to play as big a role anymore. And that's really why language and things like grammar and syntax, as we talked about previously, aren't focused on in school either. So as soon as structure is taken away, then there's really no platform, there's really no foundation for formality to be built on. So uh, has it changed? Absolutely. Has it changed for the better? I don't know. Has it changed for the worse? Uh, maybe yes, maybe no, but there's definitely been a change. You know, it's interesting that you put it that way because it makes me think of using this analogy, and I'm hoping I use this correctly, uh, of um, the uh, from the beginning to the end of the construction of a high rise. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a solid foundation bedrock that you're building into, let's say it's 75 to 100 stories or something like that, yeah. uh, then you're going to have problems. And of course, we even have a real example, not an analogy, but a real example of, of how they screwed up uh, with a building in San Francisco that is starting to, to lean because no. they didn't build on bedrock or create a bedrock if you will and yeah. now they've got to figure out how in the world they're going to keep this building from tilting uh so that it doesn't fall over and kill hundreds of th or thousands of people in the process uh and so forth and, yeah, it and it like, seems to me that that's yeah. a pretty accurate uh, a pretty accurate uh, analogy or yeah. literality <laughs> Uh, by right. the way, <clears throat> you know, I, I often talk on this program about uh, moving from survival to thrival, and I thought mm -hmm. I had created that word, and I had an interview just recently where somebody actually looked that word up, and it's in the dictionary, and I thought I had created it. I said, you know what? It's okay. I don't have to create it. I'm glad, it, I'm glad it's a word I, I didn't create. Yeah. I'm glad it was there, and I was, I was right in that respect. Right. Um, in terms I, don't, of, I don't know that I'd ever use that word that way, so that, that is interesting. Yeah, and I know that, that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's something that I think I said earlier in the interview, that if you do not know how to create the, the proper uh, uh, sentence, whether it's written or uh, whether it's spoken, uh, then you're not going to get your meaning across. Uh, and, and I mean, it's like the difference between effective speaking and effective writing versus yeah. in a, ineffective speaking or writing. Can we talk yeah. just a little bit about that? You know, I think there are certainly similarities between the spoken word and the written word, but there are also some significant differences in their creation. When I teach composition classes in college, I teach a writing process. And to go back to the building analogy that we just used a moment ago, mm -hmm. the purpose behind the process is to build a foundation for the writing, to build structure for the writing. Because as I tell the student, you can have all the knowledge or have done all the best research. If you cannot present that in the written word in a clear fashion that the reader can understand, then you have not satisfied your goal. So that is, you know, that structure is there. It's tougher to build structure when teaching public speaking, let's say, because whereas the written word is concrete, it's on paper, whether you've taken a pen or put fingers to keyboard, it's there structurally. The written word floats. <laughs> There's no ethereal foundation, if you will. You know? right. So it kind of floats. So it's harder to build that structure. So yeah, you need, you, you need to have connections. You need to have a beginning, a middle, and an end to, to oversimplify things. Uh, for a minute in both the spoken and the written word. But the big difference is the fact that, you know, the, the, the speech is not always concrete. Yes, speeches can be written out, but more often than not, people who have to make speeches don't write them out. <laughs> you know, if anything, they may put a little outline together. But, you know, that's where people get hurt, you know, if they drop an index card or if they, they get sidetracked. You know, the, yeah. in a speech, that, that's, where they, that's where frequently things go off course. And 
I, I myself, um, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's extemporaneous. It's improv, mm -hmm. if you will, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, with this program or anything else. And that's one of the things that I tell people when they, uh, uh, you know, come onto a program and they're very, very nervous. <clears throat> and I just remind them, I said, you know, um, we're always ad-libbing all the time. There's no script. At, right. at least as far as I know, who knows, maybe subconsciously, we both have a script <laughs> and, and we're reading off of our script subconsciously <laughs> and away we go. I, who knows? But yeah. in terms of the, the, it looks like it's, it's, it's growing in, in form and substance or, or maybe it hasn't ever left. But what, what do you make of this, what I consider a wonderful aspect of our culture, both locally and globally of people coming out of the woodwork as storytellers and that concept i would think that there is a whole different dynamic to being a storyteller as opposed to giving a lecture or are they imperceptibly similar I think there are differences. I think um, just the nature of the contents that's delivered in a story is either more entertaining, more interesting, more relatable is probably a better word than a lecture. Just because you just think of, you know, what people think when they hear a word lecture. Oh, no, <laughs> they fall asleep, <laughs> you know, whereas, yeah. If somebody says, you know, there was one time I went out and blah, blah, blah. You've got, their, you've got a better chance of getting and keeping their attention. So yeah, there's was, there was a definite, definite difference. Now, similarities, I mean, they sh should both be presented in some form of a structured way so that it can be followed. But I think the, the familiarity or the interest that's built in a story is uh, you know, much greater than your, your, your stodgy lecture, if you will. Right. And of course, when I think of some stories, I, the first thing that comes to my mind are Aesop's fables, especially sure. considering how I was raised on cartoons. And yeah. there was that one cartoon, Aesop's fable, which I really enjoyed. It was very funny sometimes, mm -hmm. but it did get across the moral of the story. Um, right. When we are speaking and we, we always want to try to stay on track and on task, if you will, Mm -hmm. But every once in a while, you know, we'll be talking along and, oh, by the way, a sidebar, blah, 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 blah. You want right. to make sure you bring it back to yeah. where you went to the sidebar and continue on. But making sure that that sidebar, as I call it, okay, or, or tangent, uh, is somehow relevant to yeah. the overall story. You just don't throw stuff in just to throw stuff in. It's like in a movie or a television program, when they show you the shot of a particular part of a room, a particular item, like maybe a knife or a blender or a bed or what have you, they're not showing that to you just because they're trying to fill time. Right. They're showing that to you because there's a point there that there's a relevance to that item. <clears throat> and, and sometimes people miss that until mm -hmm. you get to near the end of the program and suddenly that item all of the sudden shows up. In other words, there's this sort of formula. Yeah. So there would be a formula, whether you're writing, as you talked about earlier, or speaking, that we need to, to incorporate. Do you mm -hmm. And you teach that aspect to your students, the, the formula, so that their point gets across and doesn't get lost. Right, yeah, because as I said before, without, without the structure, the content doesn't matter. Right. I tell them that when I, day one of the writing process, it's a two-step process, one part organization, one part content. And I said, at this particular point where we're all at the beginning of this process, I will say the more important of the two parts is organization for the reason that I just mentioned to you. Yeah. I said, that's not to say that you know, content doesn't play a role because if you don't have anything to write about, then <laughs> the structure doesn't matter. It's just the foundation and nothing else. 
but yeah, the, 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 the structure has to be there. And the sidebar, I think, is a great note. And I think sometimes sidebar is misunderstood by people uh, because it sounds like it's an appendix or an addendum or something, and it's mm -hmm. not. As you said, it's relevance. You know, there's a reason why it's being added to the speech or to the talk because it fits in. Right. Although you don't want to be talking, let's say, about geology and then all of a sudden throw in, oh, by the way, my dog has fleas. And by the way, the rocks that are in this yeah. picture, you know, that's, yeah. that's like, yeah. that's the wrong yeah. kind of tangent that you want. Exactly. And, then, and, and if, you, if, you're, if you're a professor and you say something like that and students are fe feverishly taking notes, they're writing, dog has fleas. Now, wait a minute, what does that have to do with yeah, so, <laughs> so then it's not. So then it's really not a sidebar, it's a, an afterthought. <laughs> right. Although, although that could be an interesting little trick to use by the, the, the instructor to yeah. see if they're really listening. So, and at the end of the lecture, you say, and by the way, everything I've spoken about may be on the test. Right. And then you put that on the test. Yeah. What did my dog have? <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Extra I credit. think that would be uh, very humorous, uh, but no points taken off. I wouldn't take any points right. off if they didn't get it. Right, right. Joe uh, Peretta, I want to thank you so much for joining us. English uh, instructor uh, out on the East Coast, uh, safe from hurricanes and tropical storms and all that fun stuff. And, uh, and, and um, uh, we hope that you are safe and warm and dry and, and COVID-free. But uh, I want to thank you so much for giving us so much time on the program today because, uh, you know, this we could go on uh, talking about many other, other, other areas of this, including, and we won't go into this now, but this might be something for another day, including the effect on the brain pathways uh, as we either evolve our language personally, okay, whether it be written or spoken, or devolve, uh, in terms of the synapses and so forth, and the way that we will think in the future, how that can affect, because I've been interviewing some people who, uh, there's one language, for example, Sanskrit, they aren't mm -hmm. learning how to speak it for the purposes of bringing it back to life, but they're learning how to speak it and write it more for the purposes of doing just that changing the synapses, learning to think differently, raising the consciousness of the individual, which to me is a fascinating uh, study. I don't know if English has that same kind of power, but as I said, um, we can maybe bring that up in another program. I, I can't tell you how much I, I love talking about this and uh, how much I, I love having you on a program. And I'm hoping one day maybe when we can all move around and there are no storms blowing airplanes around, that maybe we can get together somewhere in the Midwest, meet halfway, you come out to yeah. Santa Barbara, who knows, maybe you'll come to the East Coast and we can sit down and continue this conversation. Uh, I would love to sit down with a, a, a room full of students again and ask the same kinds of questions I did of the Communications Association at UCSB several years ago when I asked who knew what syntax was uh, mm -hmm. and so forth and uh, see what kind of an answer I get. But I bet you I'd get the right answer from your students. Well, let's hope so. And maybe that'll be the extra credit along with the dog's fleas, we'll have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Before I let you go, I want to yeah. ask you three final questions, but I also want to let our listeners know this program can be heard Sundays at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., Monday mornings at 1 a.m., streaming live at those times at richarddugan.com. We podcast on SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, Player FM, Spotify, Blueberry, and many other locations that folks are reposting our interviews to. And if you'd like to support us, we have PayPal and Patreon accounts for your security as well as ours. Any amount is greatly appreciated, including energetic support. And don't forget about 2020, the year of perfect vision. We encourage you to spend some time going within, finding that calm, peaceful place where you can relax. I have to tell you that right now, personally, I am feeling a little overwhelmed as much as I'd like to think that, hey, I've got it all together. I'm doing these interviews. It's great fun. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm just ready, raring to go. Well, I am raring to go. But, you know, even I have those moments of overwhelm between COVID and waiting for the next wildfire and high blood pressure and high blood sugar and 
the list just keeps growing and it's like, I'm not sure I can take any more before I check out, but I, I'm going to do my best to hang in there with you. So I'm going to find that still small place, find that peaceful space. I hope you do that as well as that inspiration uh, with your intuition, that innovation that uh, you can use in your life. My first of the three questions to you is, who is Joe Peretta? Joe Peretta is a caring communicator who loves to see people grow. What is it that you hope to or want to achieve through the work that you're doing now? Let people see that there is always room for improvement and with the determination necessary, they can, they can do it. And finally, what is your life's purpose? My life's purpose is to guide people to the best life that they can possibly lead through education and belief. Once again, Joe, I thank you so much for joining us here on the program and sharing your story and the the insights into uh, a better language for us all. Uh, it, I think it does start with us as individuals. Uh, I can't force people to uh, recite a phone number without O's. And I can't force people <laughs> to stop saying this is in, me, in the media uh, when they are talking to their audience. Uh, but I can do that for myself. This is not Richard Dugan. I am Richard Dugan. And <laughs> you have been listening to Tell Me Your Story. I thank you so much for joining us. And uh, it's great to uh, have you folks listening. I really appreciate your support in that regard. And I hope that you will join us for our next broadcast podcast. Until then, love to lol.